My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. One cardiac condition that has gained a lot of prominence, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, is myocarditis. And I have lots of patients who come to see me with symptoms of palpitations, breathlessness, exercise intolerance after catching COVID. Uh, who are worried that they may have developed myocarditis. So in this video, I wanted to discuss acute myocarditis. Now, myocarditis basically means inflammation of the myocardium. The myocardium is the middle and therefore the most important layer of the heart. It lies between the epicardium and then the endocardium, and it contains all the cardiac muscle cells which are responsible for a the conduction of electricity down the heart and also these cells regulate the contraction and relaxation of the heart if the myocardium is inflamed and damaged then it will lead to problems with the electrical conduction uh, and therefore will lead to heart rhythm disorders and it can also lead to ineffective contraction and relaxation of the heart, which is termed heart failure. So the problem with uh, myocarditis is that depending on the severity and the extent of inflammation, the patient becomes more prone to heart rhythm disturbances, dysrhythmias, and heart failure, i.e. weakening of the heart muscle. Both of these conditions can be life-threatening. How common is it? Well, data from all NHS admissions for over 19 years, from 1998 to 2017, suggested that there were about 13,000 hospital admissions during that 19-year period um, with a primary diagnosis of myocarditis. However, this is likely to be a gross underestimate because a significant proportion of patients with myocarditis may not even have had symptoms bad enough to justify them going to hospital, let alone be admitted with that condition. And it is not uncommon for myocarditis to mimic heart attacks. So they, when patients present, they present very similar to heart attacks in many cases. And therefore, the diagnosis of myocarditis may be missed at the time of admission. I am certainly very confident that we are seeing a lot more admissions with myocarditis these days. This may be due to the COVID pandemic. This may be due to um, the virus itself. It may be some people feel that the vaccine contributes. And um, it may also be that there is an increased awareness of myocarditis amongst patients and healthcare professionals as a consequence of it being considered a very dangerous complication of COVID infection. If we look at these patients who are admitted, two thirds are men and compared to women, these men generally tend to be younger. So the average age of men who are admitted with myocarditis, the median age is about 33 years, and the median age of women with myocarditis is about 46 years. Why does myocarditis happen? Well, myocarditis is usually, although not solely due to infection, and most commonly the infection is from a virus. Common viruses include adenovirus, enterovirus, Coxsackie, parvovirus B19, influenza, COVID-19, and HIV. Myocarditis can also occur due to other infections from bacteria, so mycoplasma, spirochetes, staph, phylococcus, streptococcus, fungal infections, protozoal infections, helminthic infections, and even rickettsial infections. You can also get myocarditis due to non-infectious causes, such as with medication, so some antibiotics, some anticonvulsants, and even vaccines. And this is where the concern has come in the population about the, the, the COVID-19 vaccine. I've done a video on this, um, and I'll link it up to this if you wanted to watch it. Um, also, inflammatory conditions such as lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, thyrotoxicosis, and type 1 diabetes have also been associated with myocarditis. Other things, cocaine use. Uh, patients who have had transplant, transplant rejection can cause a myocarditis, and even radiotherapy, radiation can cause a myocarditis. Also, stress hormones, so excessive stress hormones, catecholamines may can cause um, can also cause a myocarditis. How does it present? Um, it tends to affect people of all ages, but most commonly between 20 and 50 years of age. 
It can have no symptoms, but in general, the commonest symptom is chest pain. This is the presenting complaint in about 85 to 95% of patients, chest pain. Uh, patients, 62 thirds of patients may also have a fever and about a half may also complain of some breathlessness. Other symptoms may include fatigue, palpitations, dizzy spells, or even blackouts. Up to 80% of people with a myocarditis will describe some kind of prodromal symptoms like a flu-like illness or a gastric or respiratory illness before they develop the, the myocarditic symptoms. A quarter of patients who present with myocarditis actually manifest with the symptoms of a complication from the myocarditis. So a quarter of patients have a complication from the myocarditis and the complications, as I mentioned earlier, are heart rhythm disturbances or heart failure or even cardiogenic shock where the heart is so weak that it is not able to keep up with the body's requirements even at rest. And the patient will then manifest a very low blood pressure and even cardiac arrest. So generally, a quarter of patients will either have some evidence that their heart has weakened as a result of the extent of inflammation, or they may manifest with electrical disturbances of the heart. Right, in terms of investigations, well, the aim of investigations in myocarditis is threefold, okay? You want to make the diagnosis of myocarditis, and you want to obviously at the same time rule out potentially even more dangerous conditions such as an acute heart attack. You want to identify the complications from the myocarditis, so you make the diagnosis, but then you also want to know whether there are any associated heart rhythm abnormalities or heart failure, because both of those are the reason why patients do badly with myocarditis. And then the third thing, obviously, is once you've worked out that the patient has myocarditis and you've worked out that they don't have heart failure, they don't have electrical issues, or they do, then the third thing is to try and work out the etiology of the myocarditis. Why did it happen? And of course, sometimes it can just be a virus, but if the patient has autoimmune disease or something like that, then that could be the explanation for the myocarditis. In terms of investigations, the ECG uh, tends to be very helpful, a 12-lead ECG. This may show signs of damage to the heart. So there may be things like ST elevation, which you see commonly in a heart attack. And this is why, you know, patients present with chest pain and they see the ST elevation, then they'd automatically assume that this was a heart attack. But some patients may then, when you investigate them further, be found to have completely normal heart arteries, in which case you then make a retrospective diagnosis of myocarditis. Um, so there may be ST elevation. It can look indistinguishable from a heart attack. Uh, we may see evidence of bundle branch block, we may see electrical issues with the heart, tachycardia, bradycardia, atrioventricular block, and also ventricular dysrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia, lots of ventricular ectopy, even ventricular fibrillation in patients who are, you know, uh, very critically unwell. Um, one thing that can be quite helpful are markers of inflammation. The commonest marker that we tend to use for inflammation is CRP. Uh, and we know that CRP levels tend to be elevated in up to 80% of patients with myocarditis. We also do troponins and troponins are often elevated. Again, that makes it even harder to distinguish between a heart attack and myocarditis because heart attacks are chest pain, troponins are elevated and the ECG is abnormal. And with myocarditis, you can get exactly the same picture. A normal troponin does not reliably exclude myocarditis, but in general, troponins are elevated. We can also do a blood test called BNP. BNP levels can be helpful. They tend to be elevated in patients with myocarditis. And when they're very high, they raise concerns that the inflammation is so widespread that it is actually causing an impairment in the ability of the heart to pump the blood out. An ultrasound of the heart is a very helpful investigation, an echocardiogram, mainly to see if the inflammation is so widespread that it is actually causing impaired heart function. You can't actually see the inflammation itself on the echocardiogram, but you can see how well the heart is contracting. And if the heart as a whole looks weak, or if there are parts of the heart that look weak, then that signifies that the inflammation is quite significant because it's actually having a vi visible impact on the, on the functioning of the heart. 
Occasionally, you may see some fluid around the heart too. This is called a pericardial effusion. Perhaps the most useful modality these days is a cardiac MRI scan. And cardiac MRI is very helpful because it allows you to look at look for scar. You know, you can actually visualize scar very well with an MRI scan. And in myocarditis, typically that scar is seen in the mid wall, the myocardium. Um, it, this is also a very useful modality to distinguish between myocarditis and a heart attack. Because with a heart attack the innermost layer of the heart is always affected, okay, because the, the blood vessels sit on the top of the heart and they send these little branches down. And so if you deprive the heart or the blood vessel, if you stop, if you block the blood vessel, the bit supplied by the tributaries from this blood vessel, which go down into the myocardium, are going to be affected the most. And therefore the scar in a heart attack, a traditional heart attack, is always from the innermost layer, it starts at the innermost layer and then it spreads upwards. With myocarditis, the innermost layer is often spared and it's always in the middle wall, middle of the of the of the wall, uh, and that can help distinguish between uh, damage that has been caused by myocarditis compared to damage that has been caused uh, by a heart attack. Uh, one thing to know about MRI, MRI can have limited accuracy in the first few days after the illness and therefore it's always a good idea just to wait a little bit longer, two to three weeks from symptom onset and that is where the MRI becomes really helpful. Now the gold standard investigation is a myocardial biopsy because although you can see the scar on an MRI scan, you don't know what necessarily what that scar is due to. But if there was some way whereby you could actually go and take a bit of the scar out and then study it under a microscope, then you would potentially work out the cause of the myocarditis. So a myocardial biopsy is the gold standard investigation. But this is a highly invasive procedure. I mean, you have to go in and actually take a chunk out of heart muscle. And there is a significant risk of complications, certainly up to 10% in inexperienced hands, inexperienced centers. And therefore, myocardial biopsy is not really done these days. And it is best reserved for only the most complex cases and should only be done in the most experienced centers. Trying to work out, so obviously you want to know about the myocarditis, you want to know about the complications of myocarditis, but then you want to work out the etiology. And as I said, a biopsy can be helpful, but otherwise it can be quite difficult. And therefore, it's very important to take a very detailed history, especially family history, travel history, history regarding medications and the use of recreational drugs. Now, in terms of management, how do we manage myocarditis? Management should always in involve input from different disciplines, such as cardiology, intensive care medicine, acute medicine, rheumatology, if the patient has autoimmune disease, respiratory medicine, if they have a chest problem, uh, which could have contributed to their myocarditis. So lots of disciplines need to come together and work in partnership for the benefit of the patient. For most people, myocarditis will settle down by itself. And the main thing for doctors to do is to ensure that the patient is not manifesting heart failure or dangerous heart rhythm disturbances. Um, patients with heart failure and heart rhythm disturbances clearly need to be in an intensive care setting and need a very aggressive input. But if you don't have any heart rhythm disturbances, the heart looks strong on an echocardiogram, everything else is stable, uh, then in general, those are good signs that the myocarditis will just settle with time. In very severe cases, uh, like patients who have a heart failure, they may need inotropic support, they may need medications to be given to them, which actually in the short term actually make the heart work a little bit better, uh, or even mechanical devices which augment the function of the heart, such as rotary blood pumps. There is some evidence that immunosuppressive therapy can be helpful, particularly in patients in whom the underlying etiology is due to autoimmune disease, such as autoimmune rheumatic disease, giant cell myocarditis, and sarcoidosis. In terms of prognosis, most patients settle down by themselves, and if the CRP, the inflammatory markers are falling and the heart function is good and there are no heart rhythm disturbances whilst in hospital, the prognosis is generally good. 
It is generally recommended that after a diagnosis of myocarditis, patients should refrain from vigorous exercise and competitive sport for three to six months because the heart is still inflamed and therefore you don't want to uh, you don't want to push it too hard for fear of causing heart rhythm disturbances. From the data, we have all-cause mortality in patients admitted to hospital with myocarditis is 4%, so quite high. Um, but as I say, the majority of patients just get better and go home. Recurrence is rare, but in 1% of patients, myocarditis may recur. And up to 30% of patients with myocarditis, particularly the ones who come in with a weak heart, where you see the heart being very weak, they can be left with a weak heart long term. If you have a strong heart during the course of the myocarditis, then it's not such a concern. But if you already present with a very weak heart in the context of myocarditis, up to a third may not recover normal function in the long term. So I hope uh, you found this useful. I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts. Once again, thank you so much for your time, uh, your listening ear. Uh, and uh, as always, I'm so, so, so grateful. Take care. All the best.